Pleased to introduce the first speaker of uh, the final day of our conference on international, uh, our international symposium on cultural diplomacy and sustainable development. Um, we have a, a, a lady speaker opening uh, the conference today, which is, is a pleasant change. Um, so we have um, Her Excellency Ambassador Therese Baptiste Cornelis. Uh, Ambassador and Permanent Representative of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago to the United Nations Office in Geneva. She holds an MBA in Information Technology Marketing and Strategy from the University of British Columbia and a BSc in Mathematics and Computer Science from the University of the West Indies. Prior to being appointed to her current position, Her Excellency was a lecturer at the University of the West Indies, uh, St. Augustine campus, and the Arthur Locke Jack Graduate School of Business, lecturing in brand equity, advertising strategy, and management of, of information systems. Ambassador Cornelis is a former Minister of Health for her country and was appointed a Senator and also Minister of Health in 2010. In her current role, the Ambassador focuses on deepening relations in areas such as finance, trade, and diplomacy. Today, she will be discussing uh, cultural diversity as a fourth policy area of sustainable development. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Her Excellency Ambassador Therese Baptiste Cornelis. Thank you. Chairperson. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, allow me to pay my sincere thanks for the Institute of Cultural Diplomacy for first hosting this and secondly for inviting me to, this is my first keynote speech since I became an ambassador. I had thought I would have stopped making speeches as I left being a minister. <laughs> so it's nice to be here. Now, coming from an academic background, because as you would have noticed, my stint in the political arena was really short. I only entered political arena because I taught the, prime, the new prime minister. So the new prime minister wanted me as part of her government. She made me a minister of health. I caused chaos. I told doctors they were making mistakes. They hated the fact that I pointed out they were making mistakes. They pleaded for me to get out. So um, I agreed with them on that plea. So I, I gave them even much more stress so they would plead louder. And then I was replaced by the, um, the MP who I was the campaign manager for in the elections. He's a doctor, he took over. And I thought I would get back to teaching, but I was sent here. And I'm actually the first um, non-career diplomat posted to Geneva. And the Prime Minister's reason, she said she still wasn't given me a reason to get out of government. And she wanted someone who supports the government's new trust, as well as someone do who can fill that, that seat in Geneva, because it's very business-oriented and stuff. And from my background in teaching, I had it. And I was like, done. I didn't even realize that was vacant. but. It was okay, now I'm an ambassador. I thought it would have been an easier job. It's not. Because um, the Minister of Health was harder than teaching. And I, at lecturing, I had a 1,000 students. And the Minister of Health was harder than that. And now, as an ambassador, they kind of cheated, because they told me it was going to be to Geneva. So I came, but it's not just Geneva. I'm also in for Paris, doing UNESCO. And I'm in Bern. And then I'm in Vienna. And I'm the ambassador to Italy. And I'm the ambassador to Austria. And I was like, this is not right. So I just came back last night from FAO conference in Italy. So jack of all trades. <laughs> now, again, from the academic background, I think I have to start, first of all, understanding cultural diversity. So if any mistakes are here, I finished this with, with the help of my, these are actually two of my um, technical experts from Geneva. And they, I asked them, help me with this. And they sent me something at, at 11 o'clock on um, Tuesday night. And then I sat till 3 o'clock in the morning changing it to me. So they're here to see how the me converts to what the diplomat's supposed to see and what the academic will see. So I'm being monitored. The definition of cultural diversity to sociologists refers to the variety of human societies or cultures in the world. Fine. But what does that really mean to us? We're diplomats. We're leaders. We're politicians. We are people who think we can change this world. Cultural diversity refers to the variety of the makeup or what we call the multiculturalism, which is not really a good word these days. We see even in England, people are starting to say that word has bad connotations, of a group or an organization. In Trinidad and Tobago, we were made as kids to learn the words of our national anthem, where every creed and race find an equal place. 
and then we always ended with together we aspire, together we achieve. And as a kid, I was proud of saying that. I mean, that was our national anthem. As adults, to be honest, I don't think many of us try to practice that because you ask some of the adults about the national anthem and they're like, yeah. And they know it only if they sing it. You know that kind of way? How many of you all, for instance, your own national anthem? If I ask you about it, you have to actually go back into the words of it to really live it. And um, what we found is that our role as leaders was try to foster this remembrance and ensure it transcends to future generations. My sister has six kids, extremely fertile. And I ask them about the national anthem, and they look at me like I'm speaking another language. Because they don't have to do what we did in school. In school, every morning we started and we placed it, and we were proud to be Trinbagonians. And now they are proud that they know what the latest songs to whatever Nicki Minjai or somebody else is singing. And they're like, who sings it? You know? Cultural diversity must include different social structures, belief systems, and strategies that cultures used to adapt to varying life situations in various parts of the world. As we look around this world, we see that there's no other phrase that rings true as was first said by that great Greek philosopher in 500 BC. Change is the only constant. And the thing is, many of us know that line changed around there, eh? but he was the one who came about with it. He believed that life is like a river. The peaks and the troughs, the pits and the swirls are all part of the ride. Many have advocated that we should do as he did, go with the flow, enjoy the ride as wild as it may be. And I am truly a person that goes with the flow, okay? I mean, I think I am one of the first persons to find someone on the internet and marry them. Okay, I was living in Trinidad, I was an IT specialist, researching technology, researching the internet. Now, a lot of you always say, why would you research the internet? Because it was new. So I was researching the internet, and my staff, who were all older than me, found that um, I, they didn't like the guy I had chosen to be my lineman partner. He wasn't of the standard that they felt. So they wanted to sign me up on the internet to find someone different that would match my culture. So to match my culture, they went on the internet and found somebody foreign. I didn't understand the logic, but they wanted to put me on the internet. And they asked me to say something about myself. Describe yourself, the, the description was. And I put a little of this, a little of that, just enough not to get fat. OK, that didn't work any part anymore. But that, at that time, it was true. And um, I've met my husband on All Fool's Day. 1996, he wrote to me and said, hi, I my name is Penguin, and you are tr I was Tropical Bear. Okay, I tried to stick with my culture. I was Tropical Bear on the internet, and he wanted to know about Trinidad and Tobago. And I wrote back, I'm not a tourist guide, so you can visit our country's website and find out about our country. You want to know about me? Write and ask. <laughs> you know, and that, and that personality has transcended throughout. I'm very blunt. We got married, I went to live in Belgium, came back to live in Trinidad. We said we would live for five years in Trinidad. Do not, how many of you all here are Europeans? Take it from me, non-Europeans. If you carry a European to the tropics and they claim they will live for five years because they don't know if they would like it, they're not coming back, okay? He fell in love with Trinidad. So there we were. 50, this, this year we celebrated 15 years of marriage. So we were always saying, next year I'll go back, next year we'll go Europe. And finally I got him to commit that we were going to leave Trinidad and Tobago in the year 2011, we would leave Trinidad and Tobago and go away. That was my plan. 2010, the opposition leader, who was one of my former students, said, hey, guess what? I want you to run for elections. I was like, nope not interested, don't like politics, politics is full of liars. Except for you, of course. <laughs> and she says, okay, but then you have to help one of our, our persons running. I said, I could do that, that I could do, stay in the background, you know, use strategy, and kind of like persuade students to vote for you. She said, how are you gonna do I said, watch me. And when I taught classes, every now and then, I would flash a little picture <laughs> of the potential prime minister in my PowerPoint and find some reason to link her. Because I mean, I have 1,000 students. It could go a long way, right? 
but I never said I was back in any political party. <laughs> and um, she won elections. I called her that night, congratulations. And my candidate, he won by a landslide. I was happy. I remember that was a Monday, a Friday morning, half past four, she calls. Um, she said, I've been trying to reach you. And I looked at the clock and I'm like, it's half past four in the morning. She said, well, I need you to be in my government. I said, yeah, yeah. Thinking she meant, you know, write another, S, another speech, because I used to write speeches for her. She said, as my minister of health. Watch me, you who, what? I always remember that. And I woke up right away. And I said, but I said I don't like politics. She says, OK, I'm asking you this as your prime minister. Now, what are you going to do then? <laughs> You're working for the government as a lecturer at a university. You can't think and right away flash, prime, be a politician or be unemployed. Be a politician, be unemployed. I said, OK, but you can't tell anybody, so, except for your spouse. So I told my spouse I could bring one person to the swearing in. I had to go and resign from you right away from the university. I go into university and I hand in my last exam papers, all corrected. Good thing I was on schedule and my resignation letter. And my university says, can we not make you a better offer? I said, no. Where are you going? Not necessarily anywhere. <laughs> you know? And that evening, I was the Minister of Health. My mother found out watching it on television. The same mother who said, if you get into politics, I'll disown you. <laughs> I left right after being sworn in and I went home to her. She was there sick. And in our culture, when you're sick sometimes, because she has the Indian culture, they wrap their heads in this um, band-aid and they sap in the head like, oh, she's dying. And she's like, what are you doing here? Everyone's showing on TV, they're still there. I said, yes, but the Minister of Health heard that you were sick. So she's here. You have the Minister of Health at your assistance. She says, I'm still annoyed. You know. So she, she grew accustomed. Every week she will tell me, there are other jobs available. You know, there are other jobs available. <laughs> And so therefore, when I left being Minister of Health, there's a picture of me on the newspaper where they say, Therese is out, front page of the newspapers. And everybody's amazed because I am there smiling because my mother is singing to me, Alleluia, Alleluia. So, so she said, you're out of politics. And I, I didn't have the heart to tell her that day that, Mom, yes, I'm no longer going to be a minister, but I'll be an ambassador. So I just <laughs> said, yeah, I'm out of politics. So here I am. The thing is, this guy was born into a wealthy family, but in the middle of his life, he renounced his fortune and went to live in the mountains. And that's what my family believed I did, because my family is as anti-politics as you can get. And I was that way too. I have always voted out the government that was in power. I believe in change. So I lived by the only constant exchange. I am actually worried what is going to happen now when elections come in 2015. Am I going to break with my tradition of voting out the government? Do I vote myself out? It's hard, and I, I will have to make that decision in 2015. The thing is, he looked at that river, and you remember, he put his foot into the river, for those of you all who know Greek history, and he says that just putting his foot into that river, the river changed. It moved around him. And the thing is, we all have an impact to make. From whatever culture we come from, we make an impact. You can be a fantastic leader regardless of where you come from. Right now, we see in all the elections for DGs, they look at where the person is from. Really? Does it really matter? How many of you all do MBAs and you do your degrees and you're in the same school with somebody else and you excel just like them, but you excel with a little difference? Because that's what makes us different is that we're different. I am not like anybody else here. Okay, and some people may say, thank God. The world as I knew it is different. The world as my mother knew it, according to her, is evolving. It has evolved. It's, it's devastating. I mean, she's really thinking that we're, we are, she's a, a Roman Catholic. So she's looking for the end to come. The world as you know it is changing in front of your eyes. The technology that people have these days, the exposure they have to information, is what makes this world look so dynamic. I tell people, things are not happening necessarily faster, but we are getting the information faster. Okay, many times we used to find out that there was a crash two days after, because it took a while to reach to the Caribbean. Now as the crash happens, it's tw somebody tweets it. Maybe even from the actual plane where it happened, they may tweet it, because they came off and they survived. We only have to turn on our televisions, browse our netbooks, our iPads, our desktops, 
glance at our iPhones, our Blackberries, our Samsungs. I mean, we hold on to this, many of us, like if it's our lifeline. Someone was telling me her, her brother told her he believes that when she dies, he must put the Blackberry with her or else she will be lost. We have things telling us how much the world is changing by the hour, by the minute, even by the second. In fact, if we are honest, never have we known so much about everybody else. Some of us actually understand other people better than we even understand ourselves. We read about movie stars, we read about leaders, we read every aspect of their lives, and we believe we know what they are about. We follow them, we like their actions on Facebook, we like their comments, we like their pictures. And I remember a few years ago, people were petitioning, and Facebook has now given you the opportunity to unlike. When liking is not enough, we comment on it. Oh, I've just walked into a movie theater, and everybody but I like that. I just saw a red flower, I like that. I mean, it gets ridiculous, you know. Yesterday I was in the airport waiting to come back, and I actually put on Facebook, I am so bored waiting in this airport, and I started to write a whole set of stupidness. And one of my students wrote, we love when you're bored, because then Facebook lights up. Because I am there writing all these things, and they're reading all my mad things about watching people pass by, and what, who is wearing what, and I'm telling them the whole world through my eyes. And I kind of say weird things. <laughs> In f that's why I get into, I have two pages on Facebook, one for my friends and some of the students who still don't want to leave, and one for the public one, because I can't put some of the things that I really want to say on the public one, because then I will be no longer in the public life. Um, so let's keep on track. We post on the timeline. Remember, we'll talk about that timeline and other things, about this Facebook phenomenon we have. Cultural diversity or multiculturalism Simply put, is the acceptance of various ethnic cultures in schools, organizations, businesses, neighborhoods, or cities. We use acronyms now, right? And each acronym means something different to different people. Yesterday, I saw something, and it said VIP. And you know, VIP was a very important person. But in Italy, it stood for very intelligent parking. And I was thinking, you know, that's true. Because a lot of VIPs cannot VIP, OK? <laughs> At the best, it involves treating impartially and fairly each ethnic group without promoting the particular beliefs or values of any group. I was in Qatar recently, and I was like, I want to know more about Qatar. So I searched out a woman dressed in black, and I was like, hi, you from Qatar? I mean, and she's like, yes. And I'm thinking, if my students could see me now, they would say, how stupid a comment. She's sitting down behind a flag that says Qatar, and I sit here in my opening statement, hi, you're from Qatar? You know, but it's an opening line, and we started to talk. And I learned so much about that culture that I didn't know. I learned so much about how much women had rights in that country that I didn't know. A woman there gets one year maternity leave. In my country, we get three and a half months. It's moved to three and a half months. I heard in America, you don't even get maternity leave. You have to take disability leave and add up sick leave and vacation leave. But we tend to look at them and think, oh, these women have no rights. And they had so much rights. She gave me, I said, how do you all, and she talked about how they have rights to get to divorce their husband. They can divorce their husbands on three things. One, if he ill speaks their family. I know in Trinidad and Tobago, a lot of husbands might have been divorced by now. Two, they can divorce their husbands if they don't give them enough money to take care of the family. Around the world, I think a lot of husbands some may be sitting in this room, may have been thrown out by now. Third thing you can divorce your husband is if he attacks you, verbally abuses you. I mean, just that alone, and you can divorce him. Granted, you can't divorce him for infidelity, because they allow multiple marriages. But I said, I mean, this is just, that's empowering them. They have rules where you say women and men working in the same job must get the same pay. We in the developed world, in the developing worlds, do we have that? We don't have that, but yet we try to judge their cultures. Cultural diversity is not social integration. It's not making people like us. Where individual groups were called minorities in the past, many times they are now the majority. I recently read in America, you find that all the groups, the African Americans, the Asians, they know if you put them together, they're the majority, and the Caucasians are the minority. 
In Trinidad and Tobago, we currently have what I said, a relatively new government. We came into power on the 24th of May, 2010. I became a minister on the 28th of May, 2010. I demitted being a minister on the 26th of June, and I became an ambassador. So by next week, I should be changing again, right, Malana? Next week? Because the, the prime minister said she's reshuffling again. So I, I called her, and I said, listen, if you need to move somebody out and move them into my position, it's vacant. And she just said, ha, ha, ha. She didn't take me on. <laughs> Our prime minister, the Honorable Kamala Pasad Bissessa, immediately formed a Ministry of Arts and Multiculturalism. The ministry was created to place our rich artistic and multicultural heritage at the forefront of our nation's development. I'm proud to be part of my government. I'm proud to serve them. We formed a new, that ministry to signal that our government's intention to develop the creative cultural economy of Trinidad and Tobago. Like many countries around the world, Trinidad and Tobago was formed by various invasions labor importations, be it via slavery or indentured laborers. We see in our nation of two islands differences in race, in language, ethnicity, value systems, religion, local cultures. All these add and make us up. I want to give you a little background about Trinidad and Tobago. A lot of you all hear about us. In fact, some people say, any, I want you to, from now on, any major incident around the world, look and see a Trinidad and Tobagonian is involved. We're not causing it, eh? but we're there. We, are, we lie right off the southern Caribbean tip of Venezuela. Our, isle, our two islands, we see Trinidad is the larger island, which is 4,828 square kilometers. Tobago is the smaller island, 300 square kilometers. Our economy is dominated by the energy sector, which is 35.7% of our gross domestic product. The other main sectors are construction, manufacturing, financial services, agriculture, and other. Agriculture currently only had 0.6% of our GDP. Over the past 30 years, the country has pursued economic diversification with varying levels of success. Recently, with this new government, we tried to advocate for a change in the mindset to accept that agriculture is the sector that can allow our nation to be truly sustainable. And as I said, I just returned from the 144th session of the FAO General Council, where I stressed that we recognize that we need to focus on our culture. We have lush grounds. It is said that the cocoa from Trinidad and Tobago is one of the best cocoa in the world. It's actually the chocolate made from that cocoa is one of the most expensive. But you found that in our country, because of the history of the cocoa farms being more for slavery, you found people soon moved away from it. We all wanted to be professionals. We all wanted to have that big job. You know, and I remember once watching, um, we were in the street, my brother and I, I'm the youngest, and he said, um, this garbage man was passing by, and my brother looked at the garbage man and bawled, a garbage man. And my mother said, everyone serves a very important part in our lives. The job of a garbage man keeps our country clean. They make sure that we can breathe in fresh air. It's one of the most important jobs one can have. Do not ever don't cry that of a garbage man. About a month later, she got called into the school, though, because they had to write what you want to be in your future. And my brother, who was really brilliant in maths and all that, had put down he wanted to be a garbage man. And um, the reason given was that, inspired by his mother, to do that. So she went to explain that she didn't really mean that is where he had to aim for, but she's just trying to show, you know, and she was a teacher, so she had a lot of explaining to do. But, like, I mean, it's really a nice job, eh, if you think about it. You work in the morning, and you have, most times after lunch, you're free. So, it could be my next juncture. <laughs> but changing the mindset of people who have grown up and been schooled into seeing that the acquiring of a business education and professional skills, medical, dental, and academic, are essential to success is not a very easy one for us to do. Showing them that using our cultural diversity as a pillar for growth and that it can indeed foster sustainable development is even requiring more re-education and reshaping of our society. Our population is just 1.3 million. Mind you, when I was growing up, I always heard our population was 1.3 million. And I always wondered, something's wrong in Trinidad. Nobody's having kids, because we stick at 1.3 million. But like I said, the reason is 
trinim begonians we learn so much our education system brings all the knowledge into us we are crammed i mean we are crammed with work from the age of 4 we have to study we have to do exams our students do exams at the age of 10 and 11 to go into a high school and based on how you do in the exam it determines which school you go to and then at the age of 16 you do more exams to go into to do more exams and at the age of 19 you do more exams you can get into university so we just keep learning 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 so it's really knowledge oriented and now we're trying to change the mindset and allow the creativity the innovation part to come true Trimagonians can be found all over this world but in reality our world is still too frequently scarred by ethnic hatreds and divisions. Trinidad and Tobago, we boast a dynamic plural society comprising persons of indigenous Amerindian, African, Indian, European, Middle Eastern, and Chinese descent. We called many of our nationals simply mixed. In fact, I have all of the previously mentioned in my personal family tree. I know some people talk about they want to go back to their roots in our country. You hear it all over the world. I want to go back to my roots. My, I will have to go actually into the sea because I have no particular land I could go and claim this is mine. Religion in Trinidad and Tobago is as diverse as our population. We have Christianity, Islamic, Hindu, and African beliefs. Our nation's religious interplay possesses yet another level of richness. We don't have that divide that because you're from one religion, you're separate. My sister, when she first got married, she married a Hindu. And I said she first got married. She's still married to him, but he changed into a Catholic. But she, she married him, and he was a Hindu. My brother got married two years ago. He's married to a Muslim. And we are all Catholics. And my mom is a catechist in the church. She's one of the head catechists in the church. It doesn't stop us. We accept, we embrace other religions. In our Twill Island state, we celebrate this cultural diversity as well as it's a source of our nation's strength. It is with this variety of mechanisms is used to have a peaceful coexistence among ethnic and religious groups. What we have done really is to try to showcase us as a multi-ethnic, multicultural society. We have different shows. We celebrate Indian music. We celebrate African music. We celebrate Chinese, any music, any art form we celebrate. In fact, some of our Caribbean nations, other nations, think that Trinidadians just love to party. We do love to party. Okay, I believe that there's nothing wrong with a good party, but we have to work hard. And my philosophy has always been work hard and party harder. <laughs> so you see, what we have really done as diplomats, we try to look at a way of life. We look at each other. We don't all look alike. It involves what is said and what is not said. Why do we link it with sustainable development? Because the World Bank says that Sustainable development means development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. But that sounds mundane. That removes the emotion. That removes the spirituality. People value being together and this togetherness. We found that sustainable development started since 1987 with the Brundtland Report. And it says we have to change course to save our planet. We have to do this. We have broken our planet. It's up to us to change course to keep this planet on its way to progress. We see next week we have the Rio 20 Plus, which came 20 years after the 1992 Conference on Environment and Development. We saw a lot of things come out of it. They had three different pillars. Cultural diversity is only recently becoming one of the pillars that we need. It is recognizing that the addition of the dimension of culture to policies aimed at sustainable development. We see culture can be a developed state of mind, the processes of development, the means of the processes, a whole way of life, a cultural heritage, a cultural identity. For Trinidad and Tobago, culture is very important. Culture is the main element of our lives. Development can only be truly sustainable if it's based and grows out of our cultural identity. Respecting, promoting cultural diversity features intercultural dialogue, prevents conflicts, and protects the rights of all groups within society. Cultural diversity is a vehicle for social cohesion and stability. We saw recently in Mauritius in 2005, they talked about cultural identity and cultural heritage. They talked about things like sustainable tourism, traditional knowledge, music, and festivals. 
Culture is a very powerful global economic engine with a value of over 1 trillion US. Globally, cultural industries account for more than 7% of global GDP. We see it's often noted that in the Caribbean, the region's impact has been large relative to our size. Many of you all would have heard of Rihanna. Yes, her music now may not reflect totally Barbadian culture, but that is where she got that input, and she became known from her music. We know Shaggy, we know Bob Marley. Trent Tobago produces a range of musical gents. How many of you all know that Who Let the Dogs Out came from Trinidad? That song has grown all over the world, and it was, from, it was one of our calypsos. I have whined to that song. And by the way, when we say whine, we do not mean drink. We mean a gyration of the hips. I am an expert of that. One day I will teach you. <laughs> Trey and Tobago produces a range of musical genres, soca, chutney, steel pan, reflective of our cultural diversity. Another key aspect is the production and export of the steel pan. The steel pan was the only musical instrument really invented in the 20th century. And it was invented in Trinidad and Tobago. We are still fighting to stop other places from claiming that as their own. It was the steel pan is a Trinidad and Tobago instrument. Some of you may not know that. Do your research. It's ours. And we will not give it up. In, in fact, Caribbean festivals have the biggest influence throughout the world. Trinidad and Tobago's carnival is the largest in the region. I don't go home for summer. I don't go home for Christmas. I go home to celebrate my mother's birthday which always falls around carnival. May I add that in an article published on the 17th of February, Trinidad Tobago was ranked one of the top 10 places in the world to celebrate carnival. We were on the top. The only two that beat us was New Orleans Mardi Gras and Belgium's Carnival Binge. Did I say I'm married to Belgium? <laughs> However, we must place ahead, we were very much ahead of Rio Carnival. In Trinidad Carnival, you see what you see in Rio Carnival as well, but you are able to participate in it. It's not a parade. You are part of that. So for many of you all, you would enjoy, you jump up with the bikinis. The staging of the National Carnival generates over 156 million annually. So I've said, if you have not experienced a Trinidad and Tobago Carnival, you have not fully experienced life. So put that on your bucket list. Also linked to the idea of culture, economic growth, is using culturally embedded livelihood. And these vary by building crafts. Cultural goods need low capital investment, and they are significant generators of employment and revenue. I would be circulating via the institute a list of different aspects we had. We came out of a meeting we had in 2005, and Keith Nurse put together a summary of how culture, the rising share of cultural goods, services, and intellectual property, as well as the threats to cultural diversities and identities associated with this globalization we are seeing. We have the challenges we have, and this is how I'll conclude, is to develop a national cultural policy. Even in Trinidad and Tobago, we have that challenge. We have, many times in countries, deficient marketing and commercialization. Like I said, many of you all didn't know who Lady Dogos came from Trinidad. It was by Anselm Douglas. Limited intellectual property infrastructure. People steal things and say, you will go to places and see Jamaica and this, and Jamaica has nothing to do with it. But they took the name because they know that you know Jamaica, Barbados, Trinidad is tropical. And they use our names and they promote things as if it's from us. It's not. We want to control it a bit. Suggestions on a way forward, I make it clear I don't have all the answers. If I did, then I would be able to do it, but I can't. No one has all the answers to all the problems of the world. But we must accept that the main aim of sustainable development is to strike a nice balance between competing and conflicting interests, intra and intergenerational. We must realize sustainable development as currently practiced in the developing world is largely informed by Western notions and is funded in accordance with the agenda of multilateral, bilateral, and non-governmental. True sustainability development depends on effective sustainability standards. Unless people who you want to implement those standards are involved in making those decisions, developing those standards, they will not have ownership and they will not be it. Luckily, I have been selected to be part of the United Nations Forum on Sustainability Standards. I'm on the advisory panel, and we start our first meetings next week. We are looking to see something, to develop something that could be all-inclusive. Let those who actually have to live out these standards be part of making the decisions on these standards. SIDS, small island developing states, are constrained 
by limitations on our natural, human, and technical resources. These are things we're going to have to look at. We're going to have to look at the cultural heritage and tradition knowledge, the cultural industries and enterprise. And there's going to be this page circulated later on that lists all these things we got from our um, a summary of a panel we had looking at how we can better do this. So there's a need for greater public discussion. Natural resources are finite, but creative ideas are not. National innovation systems and IP enforcement capacities must be strengthened around the world. In closing, let me once again thank the Institute for the invitation to speak to you today at this exciting forum. I look forward to sharing of ideas and comments and to you having a fantastic day today. Thank you. Learned a lot about Trinidad and Tobago. Does anybody have any questions for the ambassador? Hello, um, I'm Hannah Khan from the Netherlands UK, um, and I'd like to ask you a question about culture and how to maintain it in modern day society, and whether you feel if celebrating aspects of a culture are better than creating legislations, because um, Hungary as a country have created a legislation that protects their culture wherever the Hungarians travel across the world, and do you feel? Um, celebrating a culture is a more positive way of maintaining a culture rather than having to revert to legislation to protect it? The thing is, um, legislation to protect it, I don't think it as being separate to celebrating it. Because the fact is we need some parameters to operate within this world. And I think the aim of any kind of legislation is to establish those parameters. If it means it's a constrictive method, then it's wrong. But if the legislation is open enough that it allows the celebration to have ways of expressing yourself and you, can, you don't have to like only do it this way, then it's not a problem. But without it, you find, therefore, true understanding may be lost. And I think the aim of the legislation, having been from a cabinet, is to allow those parameters to be set as a guiding tool to people. Okay. Any more questions? Maybe we have time for one more. She was that bad that nobody had a question. <laughs> we are slightly pushed for time, so if, if there are no more questions, then I would like to ask you, everybody, to give one more round of applause to Her Excellency Ambassador Therese Baptiste Cornelis. Thank you. <laughs>